This webinar is Storytelling for Scientists, Using Narrative to Achieve More Effective Science Communication. Our presenter today is Will Hong, who is with the State University of New York at New Paltz. <clears throat> Will has written, Ask Any Communication Specialist How to Have a Greater Impact on Your Audience, and Regardless of the Content of the Message, You'll Likely Hear the Following in Response, Learn How to Tell a Good Story. But what does that mean exactly? And how does one square the imperative to convey the objective conclusions of one's scientific research with a communication style that uses the techniques of fictional storytelling? Must this mean a compromise of the integrity of research, the scientist? Thankfully, the short answer is no. And this webinar will discuss the basics of narrative, its role in communicating science to disparate audiences, and how you might be able to deploy storytelling to draw students and lay people alike and other scientists to your work, facilitate greater understanding through metaphor, and create more memorable messaging and presentation of sustainability issues, research, and solutions. Why is this important? The science of sustainability and science in general is no longer relegated primarily to the hallowed ground of the ivory tower and its classrooms. Science has become politicized like never before. See climate change denial, alternate facts, etc. The techniques of narrative are central to this transformation and the global stakes couldn't be higher. By understanding the role of storytelling and persuasion, we can become not only better communicators, but also better readers of the culture at large and help our students become the same. Will Hong is assistant professor in the Department of Digital Media and Journalism at State University of New York, New Paltz. He received his MA in art history at Princeton, specializing in the history of photography and cinema, and then transitioned to filmmaking and earned his Master of Fine Arts at the NYU uh, Tisch School. He spent two decades in the film and television industry in New York City, working on short and feature length films, music videos, TV commercials, and promos. He worked with, among others, ESPN, HBO, Kenneth Cole, Macy's, MTV, reality TV shows, and um, corporate clients. He has taught the fundamentals of storytelling and filmmaking at the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute, the New York Film Academy in New York City, the Dalton School, and Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. He lives now in the Hudson Valley with his spouse and their very sensitive beagle. With that, Will, let me turn the microphone over to you. Thanks so much, Ira. Appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate everybody uh, who's turned out today. Um, it's been a really nice response, and, and I'm glad people are interested in this topic, uh, as I am. Um, I, I do a little disclaimer in advance. I have a bit of a cold, and so I, I'm going to try uh, not to cough, um, but a, a couple might sneak out, and uh, you know, I'll try and warn you in advance so I don't kind of blow out your eardrums if you're listening on headphones. Um, so yeah, today um, what I want to talk about was storytelling and its role in uh, the work that we all do. Um, Ira mentioned the conferences that he and, um, and Peter put on the past couple summers for faculty who are uh, interested in learning, uh, well, gathering resources and learning how to teach sustainability. Um, I've been to both, I, I attended both of the conferences, um, which are terrific. and. Um, in addition to the other sustainable, uh, sustainability conferences that I've been to, um, most of which were populated by scientists, um, I, I'm sort of one of the few humanities people who tends to show up at these things. Um, it, it got me thinking a lot about um, sort of uh, my role and how I could potentially help. And so that, that's what we're gonna try and um, uh, go through today. What I'm going to try to present to you, uh, my perspective on, on, on things that I can maybe offer you. Um, now, this first slide, by the way, uh, the, the picture of the globe, I'll be perfectly honest, that came with a template for PowerPoint. Um, but it's good, actually, it fits, because um, as a good storyteller, you always want to make sure that your audience knows what's at stake, right, for uh, your characters or, you know, the people uh, you're talking about, and there you go. Um, so let, let's just uh, dig in and see how it goes. <clears throat> okay, so where are we going, or where am I going to go with this? Um, first, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, how we 
define stories? What, what are stories in the first place? Um, how should we uh, you know, define them? And then um, how do they um, play a role in science communication and sustainability co communication, which are, you know, as far as I can tell, slightly different. Um, I would love to hear your ideas uh, at the end of this um, as to that specifically. Um, persuasion, <coughs> excuse me, persuasion um, is part of this, right? Uh, and I know uh, that as uh, professionals in the world of science, um, this can be a bit of a tricky thing to um, talk about and think about in, in respect to your own work. Um, storytelling is largely linked with fiction, and of course it, the techniques can be used um, uh, in lots of different ways. Um, so it, it can be worth talking about ethics, and that's another thing I hope that we can eventually talk about and maybe make a larger discussion. Um, and then I'll get into what uh, I hope is sort of a primer. Um, maybe for some of, some of you, if you've taken, say, a creative writing course or something, um, this might seem familiar. But um, there are rules to st storytelling, and I'll, I'll go through those. So at least you can take away some of those if, if this is something that you uh, yourself would like to do. Um, new media and technology has, of course, changed the entire cultural landscape, right? Um, there are certain trends that are emerging from that, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then finally, at the end, um, just sort of some suggestions as to what you, um, where you might start if you uh, are going down this path um, and maybe have never done this before. Uh, there are some good examples, and I'll show you a couple at the very end, um, of successes. And uh, maybe they can serve as models. And, and again, at the very end, I'd be happy to talk with you uh, about um, uh, specific steps. OK. <clears throat> so where do we start? Well, we start at the beginning, of course, right? Once upon a time. Um, now. If you're anything like me, if you hear these four words, right, um, you uh, immediately, and someone's speaking to you, uh, you immediately adopt a different mindset, right? Um, it's uh, a sort of unspoken pact that is, um, occurs just naturally because we know what is about to come, which is a story of some kind of narrative, right? Um, well, what does that mean? Is that information? Yeah, it's information of, of a sort, but if I say, once upon a time, you know that I'm not here to um, lecture you, to try to evaluate you in any way or judge you. Uh, I'm not, I may be passing on information, but it's not like you're going to be um, tested on that information. Uh, what I'm here to do is to enthrall you, okay? Uh, on some level, I'm going to engage you emotionally um, in a way that is not transactional, okay? That I'm not looking for anything in return, uh, theoretically, okay? Um, I, this is in a way, a form of a gift. Um, and because we all understand that, um, the stories have an enormous power over us because uh, we open ourselves up to them, right? We, we tend to enjoy them, right, uh, if they're good stories. And uh, they may even be uh, more memorable than um, uh, uh, information that is passed on that is not in this sort of vein, of course. So, um, you know, we're all obviously familiar with this since, you know, from the time that we're kids and uh, we are read bedtime stories. Um, it's uh, just a, sort of a natural, hardwired uh, part of being a human being. <clears throat> well, what, what's embedded in that? Um, when an audience receives a story and, and they, they give you their attention, um, what they're really expecting, and part of that sort of unspoken contract, is tell me about me. I'm going to listen to you, and I'm going to you know, pay you the respect of giving you my attention and listening to, or watching your movie or uh, listening to your podcast or um, reading your news story, let's say, um, at the end of the day, and this is not necessarily a conscious thing, um, but um, it is, it's, almost, it's always there, is I want to know something that relates back to me. Now, this is not selfish, right? This is not um, you know, uh, uh, derogatory in that way. It's just how, again, we're kind of hardwired. And it points to the purpose of how, uh, of what stories, um, uh, well, such as their overall purpose, right? They are the way that um, we communicate to one another and start to make sense of the chaos that is the world and the universe. Um, yes, you can do it logically, and we'll talk about how this kind of breaks, breaks down in, in, in just a bit. Um, but in the large scheme of things, this is how we learn to live, by telling each other stories. I mean, think about all the great religious texts 
uh, of, you know, created by humanity, right? They're all essentially in storytelling form, passed down from oral tradition and then codified in text, right? Um, and how they derive their power is through providing an experience that is primarily emotional. Yeah, there, there might be some, uh, some factual information that is passed along that might in fact be useful, that has some utility, um, but that's not uh, where the power is for stories. And we all know this, okay? This is not news to anybody. Um, just think to your favorite book or your favorite movie, the ones that you, you know, have loved for forever, right? It's because you had an emotional reaction to that text or movie um, and it stuck with you, right? It may have even changed, uh, you know, your life in a way. Um, <clears throat> I know that when I was a kid, I watched uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark when um, it first came out in the theater. Yeah, that's how old I am. Um, and I thought, you know, what Harrison Ford was doing up there was uh, amazing. And it got me interested in archaeology. And I eventually ended up in art history. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason why I went into art history. But, you know, I, I did watch it five times when I was a kid uh, in the theater. And it had an impression. Anyway, um, and it was emotional. Um, so this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. And, of course, this happens every day, right? Um, but depending on what your professional uh, sphere of interest is, you, you may or may not uh, engage in stories sort of regularly. Um, and in science, I don't think that's necessarily the case. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Well, this is verified by the, you know, some of the greatest uh, storytellers that we have. Um, and here's Tolstoy saying that art is that human activity which consists in one man's consciously conveying to others by certain external signs the feelings he has experienced and in others being infected by those feelings and also experiencing them. Um, again, the, the, the key there is uh, infection, right? It's I feel something, I experience an emotion, I create a story, or, or in this case, uh, you know, a work of art. He's talking about fiction, but he's also uh, extending that to the, the larger world of art. Um, and uh, I, through that creation, pass on those feelings and emotions so that the person, the audience, the reader experiences those. <clears throat> okay, so science. Well, why, why should we consider stories here in science? Well, there's a practical uh, application and result as well. So um, we know that there's greater recognition and recall of information. Um, as uh, indicated in this um, at the colloquium down at the bottom that cited the science of science of communication, which uh, some of my information here is pulled from, and I encourage you to go find this document. It's out there on the web and um, has a, quite a bit more information than I'll be able to present today, but it's a fascinating read. Um, but something that came out of it is that through stories, information is recalled twice as well and read twice as fast as evidence-based content. Um, again, this is not too surprising intuitively, um, because um, we receive stories in a different way. And if we're engaged emotionally, we're much more likely motive, to be motivated to um, pay closer attention to whatever it is that's put in front of us. Um, you also have greater resonance with uh, broader and different audiences, right? Um, you can make uh, essentially a human connection with somebody with whom you may not have a professional connection, right? Or a scientific um, connection. Uh, and if you wanna change behavior, uh, you actually have to first move somebody emotionally um, to do that. Uh, and we'll get into this a little bit in just a second. Um, certainly more stories are more effective uh, at getting attention in the first place. Um, all of the media industry, I worked in the television and film industry for a while, but all of it, news included, is um, a story industry. And so if you're talking about pers being persuasive and trying to get out information that you think is important to say the public or a lay person, this is the way that it, it is done out in uh, the business. <clears throat> There's an interesting uh, study here by uh, Catherine Milkman and Jonah Berger. Um, and they, what they did was they um, uh, went to a number of scientists and, uh, who had published recently, and they asked um, co-writers on a particular piece of work to uh, summarize the, the work for um, uh, public consumption. And uh, in this case, they had two co-writers on the same project to describe the same work the same way. Um, and you can see the results. Again, you know, I'll let you read through it. I won't read through all these words um, uh, now. But um, depending on how the story was told with respect to that 
research. The effect uh, in terms of uh, the, the research being shared, right? The information actually being uh, engaged with on a higher level and then shared with other people uh, went up or went down according to how emotionally engaging it was, right? And so you can see some of the results here, um, nearly, you know, nearly double um, emotionality and positivity on the left for this little um, summary versus um, <clears throat> one that is a little bit less, uh, more technical and less human oriented uh, on the right and a lower level of emotionality um, and less, as a result, less possibility for it being shared. Um, so these are all connected. If you, and if you want to get uh, uh, your workout and to be able to communicate effectively, these are all factors that you should consider um, because it has a really a, a strong practical effect on whether or not um, your work will be uh, communicated to a broader audience. Now, sustainability is, is slightly different, as far as I can tell, um, from science itself. Right. So science, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, like a lot of politicians, like to say I am not a scientist. Okay. But it seems to me that science is is, is about the discovery. Right. You're out there trying to find the truth of what's going on in, in the world, in nature. Right. And the discovery itself is uh, um, has value on its own. Right. In the in sustainability, we are looking to take that information and then act upon it. Right. Um, perhaps uh, inspiring. Uh, beneficial action on a societal level, on a cultural level, or on a personal level, right? Um, taking uh, what we know, uh, the facts of um, what it means to recycle your your plastics, or to start a compost bin in your own house, right? Um, or to try to uh, influence people to vote for policy that's going to have a, a much more beneficial effect on the, let's say, the entire country or or locally, right? Um, sustainability seems to take that next step to the action. Um, this was something at, at, at IRA's conference in the summer. Um, David Orr gave the keynote, um, and um, I kind of expected him to talk about uh, in, from the environmental studies side, but rather his keynote was almost 100% a, a, a political uh, um, speech and talking about um, what we needed to do in sustainability uh, circles to try to uh, engage um, uh, the public and inspire action so that we could get actual progress and changes done. And it seems to me that if we don't take it to that next step, then we will have fallen a little bit short of uh, our goals in terms of the sustainable development movement. Um, if that's the case, then uh, we really need to look at storytelling because personal behavior, if that is what we're looking to affect in some way positively in the long run, are driven by emotions, right? Um, you, we all we all know this um, that uh, you know we can present uh, people with uh, all the facts in the world, and that is not going to be nearly as effective as if we engage with uh, them emotionally in terms of having a lasting effect. Um, the people who do know this are Madison Avenue. Like advertising has known this for forever, from decades and decades, right? If you look back at the history of advertising, uh, initially you would see ads like um, you know for say a new vacuum cleaner that presented logically why you should buy the vacuum cleaner it has more capacity is lighter to push around the, the living room um you know the cord is longer um uh, whatever it was there are facts and essentially evidence pretty quickly madison avenue and, and public relations realized that that's not the way to move people um to buy more stuff um the way to engage them is emotionally and if you think about it i mean i ask you to think about the last uh, iphone ad you just saw because um, I'm sure they're, they just came out with three new ones. I'm sure there you've seen uh, at least uh, some of them. They've been pushed to you on your phone or something. Um, and um, they're almost entirely uh, emotion-based, right? There's nothing you're going to learn about this new phone uh, on the technical side in an advertisement. Um, it's all about the experience and what you know um, uh, you will gain from being a, a proud owner of this new iPhone uh, rather than how um, it might actually be improved over your previous phone, because the truth of the matter is it's not really that much better than your perfectly capable old phone, right? Um, and so they have to sell it through emotions, and it's quite effective. Um, and you know, the whole advertising industry is based around this premise and strategy. At the end of the day, we're really of two minds. 
And again, this has become uh, part of our popular uh, sort of uh, conversation and consciousness now uh, as research from behavioral economics um, and behavioral uh, social psychology has come uh, to the forefront in bookstores and in terms of popular narratives like these here. Uh, Daniel Kahneman and, and um, Richard Thaler and Sun, uh, Cass Sunstein, you know, Nobel Prize winners. Okay, so the research is, is certainly obviously of the absolute highest level. Um, but what they have pointed out is that um, what we think of ourselves, while we think of ourselves as rational in, our, in terms of decision making and um, uh, uh, behavioral choices, um, we're really not for the most part. You know, we're controlled way more than we think uh, unconsciously by our emotional brain. Um, you, know, you can break it down to the prefrontal cortex and the uh, amygdala, right? The rational and the emotional sides of, of our consciousness, right? Uh, Kahneman talks about it being system one and system two. Um, the whole uh, basis of uh, classical economics is based on a rational actor, right? Um, who is going to uh, act in his uh, self-interest all the time um, and perfectly logical. Well, along comes uh, behavioral economics and says, well, that's actually, you know, it's useful to, to create models, but it's not the way people actually behave. Um, when I started reading this stuff, I, I, th I found it kind of curious because um, this is, you know, it was almost like the science was starting to catch up with the dramatists because um, uh, dramatists have been studying this stuff in irrational behavior since the beginning of time, right? From, you know, Aeschylus to Shakespeare uh, until today. Um, this is what's sort of being uh, recorded in, in uh, theatrical work or in films and uh, storytelling of all, all kinds. Um, but the important thing here to, to uh, realize is that, again, if we want to get at behavior, we have to go this emotional route or at least consider it. Um, and the way to do that is, is through storytelling. Now that brings us to um, persuasion, which I know can, you know, for um, scientists, I presume anyway, it can be a little bit of a, um, uh, sticky area to talk about, but um, let me just run through the, the basics um, uh, as far as uh, you know what's useful, practically useful um, for me in my work, and also uh, what might be useful, hopefully, for you in thinking about the way you approach storytelling. Um, on the left here, we have Aristotle. Okay, uh, this comes out of his work. Uh, he's obviously a very smart human being, and um, he broke it down this way in terms of the three components of what makes um, an argument a person persuasive. So first you have logos, right? <clears throat> these are the facts, the evidence. Um, you know, if you're making an argument, this, this is uh, what you're presenting as the reasons and uh, the rational part of your argument. Um, and I, again, presume that this is where science sort of lives and breathes, right? It's all about that. Um, separate the uh, uh, emotional out of it. Um, that's not relevant. It's just about objective truth, um, which of course is, is correct, right? It's what it should be. Um, but Aristotle goes on to say, well, that's not it. Pathos, which is what we were just talking about, um, the emotional side, um, the emotions that you can uh, drum up or um, inspire in your uh, listener or the person you're talking to and trying to persuade um, have a very big effect, okay? And again, this is advertising knows this, right? Uh, and then the third component, which is uh, curiously more and more important these days, I think, is, um, technology has, has kind of made it so, is ethos. Now, what does that mean? It's the likability of the person trying to make the argument. Um, <coughs> the character, the um, uh, sort of authenticity and uh, credibility of the person. Um, you know, in today's world where so much of what's online and online activity is about developing a persona, right, whether it's on Facebook or LinkedIn, and we all have these profiles where we're curating these versions of ourselves, this becomes more and more important because the more we think about it, the more um, we start to become sensitive to other people that we encounter who are presenting us with information um, and evaluating them uh, for their credibility. Um, and so uh, in any case, these three different components are all going into uh, what you want to, sort of the starting point in terms of the per persuasiveness of your argument and um, the degree to which it's going to be shared or received and, and remembered. Now ethos, again, specifically for, sci for scientists, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, again, coming out of that colloquium, um, uh, Susan Fisk from Princeton um, noted that uh, scientists come across typically, and this is sort of, you know, a, a generalized 
understanding of it, as competent but cold. Now, wh what does that mean? That means that um, scientists are, you know, received by audiences as uh, authorities, okay, but um, they're not always entirely um, uh, sort of automatically trusted, right? Whereas someone like a doctor uh, might be uh, competent but warm, right? Uh, you might go in with a slightly different attitude in terms of uh, receiving whatever they have to, to say. Um, she went on to say people trust people who they think share their values and goals. And with scientists, apparently, um, we're not entirely sure what their intentions might be, values, goals, um, uh, right off the bat. Um, this is where telling a story, however brief it might be, um, when you are engaging an audience for the first time and about to uh, present your work, um, can pay a lot of dividends. Um, you can, uh, <clears throat> again, connect on an emotional level right off the bat, and that can go a long way to creating a sense of trust. Uh, even, again, if it's very brief, um, the sense of moral humility is um, a, a component of it. And if you think um, to, I presume most of us have seen uh, an inconvenient truth, right? And the presentation that Al Gore uh, made a thousand million times, um, uh, that was a uh, centerpiece of the, that movie. At the beginning of every one of his presentations, he would come out and introduce himself and tell a little joke, right? He would say something, he would introduce himself as, you know, the former next president of the United States or, you know, a recovering politician. Um, a little self-effacing um, uh, sort of comment that seems a little bit throwaway, but we all know the effect that that has, right? In, it's, in, in essence, it's a little mini narrative that he kind of throws out there to try to connect to his audience right off the bat before presenting you know, a single bit of information um, and to establish essentially trust, right? Just in those two little jokes, we, know, we can recall the entire narrative of the 2000 election and how he had these grand ambitions of, of becoming president, which were squashed and, and, and you know, he went into a little bit of a downward spiral after that, but then bounced back really well. That's all narrative that's built into even just a little joke like that, okay? Um, and so here's an example, again, of, of, of understanding your ethos, right, um, and uh, going to a certain length to try to um, uh, address that before you start to present the logos part of your communication. Now, again, uh, this does, talking about persuasion may feel a little odd um, coming from a science uh, background, and I would love to have an ex uh, like a, um, a more extended conversation about this and to, to find out um, what you as scientists think about this. Um, is this okay, right? Is, is it okay to start to, uh, you know, dip into uh, persuasion techniques um, to uh, start to, you know, um, <clears throat> fashion some com communication around something that's other than the facts and, and the evidence that you want to pr um, present and the conclusions that you've drawn? Um, you know, are there limits to be observed in, uh, you know, uh, going down this route, um, and at the end of the day, the bottom line is: is do, will these stories eventually help you uh, establish cre credibility? Or you know, there's an argument that says that maybe not. I think that it probably depends almost entirely on your audience, right, and who you're addressing at a particular time. So uh, you might choose to use these strategies at certain times and not at others. Like I, I presume if you're going to a conference that uh, is squarely in your field and you're talking with other scientists, you, you really don't need to, to deal with all this because um, your credibility is already established, right? The, it's a different sort of expectation from the audience. Um, and so you address it differently. And of course, this is you know true for everything I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, you pick and choose as needed uh, what you um, uh, want to use to uh, more, more excuse me, most effectively communicate what you need to communicate. Um, but this is something I hope that we can get back to maybe at the Q&A part of it, um, if not uh, beyond that. But okay. <coughs> um, what are the rules? Okay, uh, if, you're, if you've come looking for a little bit of um, what I was taught in school in terms of how to tell a story and what c constitutes a, a strong story, um, we can start to talk about those here. So one of my favorite quotes that has to do with this is from Flannery O'Connor, a great short story writer, um, Southern Gothic literature, and she said, um, it's always wrong, of course, to say that you can't do this, you can't do that in fiction. You can do anything you can get away with, but nobody has ever uh, gotten away with much. Um, meaning that um, even the most, you know, if you can think to like the most experimental fiction, postmodern metafiction, um, where there's, there's no plot and, um, 
uh, you know, it's, it's, it may be formally kind of uh, confusing and difficult to get through. Um, if it works, it works because it's on an emotional level and there's still some of the principles uh, that are laid out that we're just about to look at um, still apply. Okay, that's sort of the magic of the really good uh, experimental stuff that it can kind of do both. Um, but let's see what those, those rules are. And again, we'll go back to Aristotle. Turns out he was a pretty smart guy. And he also looked at um, drama and tragedy in particular in his, his book, um, it was really kind of a pamphlet, um, poetics, at least what has survived. Um, and he came up with essentially um, observations. Now these are not his rules per se, right? This is not what he thinks uh, storytelling should be. This is him observing, right? Uh, and, and thinking really hard about the uh, theater and drama of his day and uh, pulling generalizations or commonalities out of it and giving us these sort of rules. And they go kind of like this. This is you know, a bit simplified, but um, sort of the gist of it. So first is that the plot drives the drama, meaning that um, in any story, it's really about the action. Okay? We tend to think of stories about a character. Um, that's natural because the characters are the center of our focus. But um, that character is not interesting to us, no matter how sort of you know, flamboyant or interestingly drawn he or she is, until that person starts to um, uh, commit to a, a course of action. Generally, that is working towards a specific goal. In other words, the character, whoever it is, wants something really bad and will do anything to try and achieve that goal. Um, and for whatever reason, circumstances in intervene, um, now is the time when that character has to go after that goal. And so what we are engaged by as an audience is uh, identifying with the character, saying that, okay, um, let's see how this turns out, right? And come hell or high water, as the character kind of goes through uh, um, experiencing trying to get the goal, um, maybe succeeding at times, maybe failing at other times, um, eventually we'll see how it turns out. Okay, and that's sort of all the character is, is some of those actions. Now, what gives the story, any story, sort of its juice or tension, right, is you probably heard this conflict, okay, and where does the conflict come from? It comes from big obstacles, formidable obstacle, obstacles standing in that person's way. Um, so the character <clears throat> is trying to get this, uh, achieve a goal, but um, X, Y, and Z uh, prevent the character from uh, achieving the goal. And we want to see how the person is going to get past those obstacles or maybe not get past the obstacles. Um, you know, we tell our students all the time, the character doesn't necessarily have to succeed. And when you're telling a story, the character just has to try. You know, the, the, the journey, of the character may end in total failure. It may end in the death of the character. We don't know. And that's why we're intrigued. And that's why we're uh, emotionally engaged and, and sucked into stories because we want to see how it turns out. Um, in a longer story, if you have time, you're going to have reversals where um, along that journey, the character may succeed at other times and it looks really good at certain times. And then uh, at other times may come across an unexpected uh, failure. And this, of course, is interesting to us is because this is what life is like, right? All of us can identify with that uh, and, and find parallels to our own lives. Again, tell me about me. Um, and by doing that, by, by seeing that, we can extrapolate and learn a little something about how to live our own lives, maybe better, right? Um, and, and, and understand the world at the very least a little bit more clearly. Um, uh, Aristotle also talks about a beginning, a middle, and end. Okay, this seems kind of self-evident, but what this really means is that the story has to start someplace and end someplace different. Has to travel a little bit, right? The world of the character starts at one place and then ends at a different place. And finally, he says, uh, single circuit of the sun, meaning, well, you want to kind of compress your time frame when you're trying to tell a story. Now, how does this relate to back to what we're talking about? Oops. I'm going to present um, a graph here that um, uh, sort of illustrates this. Um, and you can see, uh, again, what he's talking about is um, this is from Cinderella. And um, in order to uh, keep your audience's attention okay, um, over a long period of time, you not only um, need to develop the intention and the obstacle for the character, right, but along the way, um, uh, the stakes have to get higher and higher, where you um, uh, progress along this um, 
so we can see it here uh, described as an upward curve. Complications, uh, as indicated by the zigzag, and we all know the story of Cinderella, um, where at, at times, again, there are reversals. There are good, good moments and bad moments. Good moments being invited to the ball. Hey, I'm going to eventually meet the prince. And then bad moments where the evil stepmother says, um, no, you can't go. The fairy godmother intervenes, right? Um, but then uh, there's a time limit, and um, you have to be home by midnight. And we all know how this turns out. As the story progresses, it gets more and more tense because you, you care uh, more and more about this character who's really trying to improve her circumstances. Um, and, and at the end of the day, we don't really know, you know, or if you're a kid and you're hearing this fairy tale for the first time, how it's gonna turn out, right? That keeps us engaged, that keeps us uh, attentive to the story, and at, at the very um, end of it, we find out how it worked out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Once you've got these sort of rules uh, down, and again, this is you know just um, uh, in terms of thinking about your own work uh, in, in the sciences and how this might apply. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll point out that the scientific project, as far as I can tell, is analogous to this, right? If we go back, <clears throat> um, you're pursuing a goal, which is uh, to try and, uh, you may have a hypothesis where you're trying to uh, uh, uncover a truth, um, uh, about whatever it is in your field of study, right? And of course, you're going to encounter um, obstacles along the way uh, in terms of trying to, uh, you know, run experiments and do research, collect data, whatever it is, analyze that data, draw conclusions from that data, um, where you may find success, or you may find failure, you may have to go back, right? This is essentially the same thing that we're talking about with uh, dramatic action, okay? Um, so um, it's analogous, and um, you could, and at times, uh, scientists have even put themselves as sort of the, the centerpiece of their own storytelling, uh, which you know certainly makes sense because um, they are, are parallel to what we already expect out of stories and characters involved. <clears throat> Once you start to identify the plot um, uh, uh, that you sort of want to address, you can start to think about the audience. Okay, and this is important because just for really practical reasons, because. Um, of course, different messages are going to resonate with different people. Uh, and um, from one set of facts, you can uh, frame your information quite differently, um, depending on who you talk to, as I mentioned before. Specifically, what this means is you want to uh, get a sense of the language you should use and what you shouldn't use, okay? Um, and try as best you can, and you, know, you can either do this very formally out in the industry, um, uh, there are market research firms that do this, right, for networks um, who are testing um, uh, uh, new sh television shows, for example. Uh, you want to know what moves them, right, what they like and what they don't like in the simplest of terms. Um, in terms of science, this is sort of interesting, a uh, little study here, Bill Hallman did, um, and he uh, presented a number of subjects with their, uh, a story about animal cloning and specifically about Dolly the sheep, if you remember that story from, from years ago. And then he asked the subjects in the study um, what they wanted to know, having heard this information. What else, did, um, where were their interests after that? And you can see here the list of uh, questions that they asked in the order of, uh, they're sort of in a hierarchy from the most commonly asked question to the least commonly asked question. And you can see at the very top, um, audiences wanted to know who's doing this research. Where are they doing it? Why are they doing it? Um, where are the goals? <clears throat> what are the goals of the research? What that all suggests, oh, and number eight, okay, which is where a lot of um, discourse in science and a lot of science communication um, tends to exist. How does it work, right? The explanation, the science behind it, right? That was pretty low down on, on the list. Um, it turns out that audiences, um, you know, they'll eventually get around to that information. It's not like they don't care about it. But the way they care about a whole lot more is, again, how is it, this going to affect me, right? Who's doing it? Who's this person? Should I be concerned about that? Um, and should I trust the person who's doing this? Um, where, where are they doing it? Is it near to where I am? Am I going to be affected by this in any way? I'm not saying this is a conscious thing. This is most likely not. But it's still the way that um, our brains are sort of hardwired in, uh, in terms of responding to a new set of information uh, presented to us. Um, <clears throat> So again, another argument, you know, once you start to get a sense of who your audience is, um, you can begin to address some of this stuff through uh, different modes of, of storytelling and engaging them, again, uh, emotionally. Another example from uh, climate change, right? Uh, this is something that all of us are, are concerned about and all of us are, have been working on. 
uh, for sure. Um, the more you know about the audiences that you're about to address, the more effectively you can uh, uh, present yourself and present the information uh, right out of the gate so that they'll be more receptive to the, the research and the work that you've done uh, that they um, is important is important for them to know. So here's Debbie Dooley. Now, if you don't know who she is, she is a, um, the uh, one of the co-founders of the Tea Party, and um, she also happens to be a, a, a climate change activist. Okay, but she wouldn't say that because that's not how she would um, uh, uh, what she would call herself. Um, instead, she's uh, concerned about the environment and uh, supports the initiatives that uh, are typically considered part of the climate change. A progress movement. Um, but she says that if you're going to talk to somebody in her political sphere, uh, as a Tea Party member, for example, you've got to talk about global warming with these different terms like energy freedom, energy choice, um, national security, and, and innovation. Frame it differently, right? Um, if you go in there and, and, lead, and she says, if you lead with climate change, the audience, they're not going to pay a bit of attention to anything else you say. Climate change, the, the, those two words are so politically loaded at this point that you've kind of lost your audience before you've even begun. Whereas if you start to talk about how it's a, you know, a threat to national security and the Department of Defense has actually stated so officially, um, you'll get their attention and then you can present the science, right? Which will, they'll, they'll be that much more receptive to uh, once you've established again, that little level of trust. It's the same um, by honoring the, the sort of diction and vocabulary um, you can uh, open up ears uh, in terms of the, the audience that is in front of you. And it's not just working, you know, uh, uh, sort of adjusting your story to the right wing, for example. Um, also with millennials, <clears throat> you might expect that they'd be much more receptive to uh, traditional modes of, of talking about the things we talk about at these conferences. But actually, there was a really interesting uh, piece on NPR not too long ago. Um, <coughs> how. Um, they were interviewing a family, uh, all of whom, all the members of the family, were very engaged in terms of conservation and environmentalism, except the youngest member of the family um, uh, is 23, or was 23 at the time, and she does not like being called an environmentalist. Um, in fact, she uh, you know, finds it almost somewhat offensive, and she says here, it's starting to be used in a more derogatory way. Oh, you're such an environmentalist. You're not in touch with the real world. Um, and you can see up here the, the Pew Research Center data, um, uh, the survey, um, where we can see this big drop between even uh, my generation, Gen X, and millennials in terms of how uh, you uh, identify yourself has become very, very important. Um, in the story, she goes on to say that she'd much rather be considered a social entrepreneur, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, I'm not sure what that means exactly, but, um, but, but you, you, ha you have to honor it. Because again, if you come out and uh, use the wrong terminology in, you know, sort of uh, the beginning of whatever you're trying to present, um, you might lose them, the, the audience, and uh, you won't get a chance to get to the important stuff um, later on because uh, they will have turned off. So again, two different examples of why this is uh, all important. Now, the words themselves, <clears throat> again, take on really uh, it, uh, serious weight. Um, and um, so again, with your audience research, if you can get to the point, and you may know this is, this is Frank Luntz, he's a, a pollster who you know, worked for the GOP for a long time, and now I think is somewhat of a, a free, freelance um, pollster. Um, but in, back in 2010, he did a uh, presentation, and we can see one slide from that presentation. I encourage you to go find it on the internet. It's really quite fascinating. Um, where he's talking about the language around environmentalism and in, in particular, uh, you know, sustainability and clean energy initiatives. Um, and in this slide, we can see that just these different words have a whole lot of impact on ter in terms of the reception and the positivity uh, uh, with respect to, um, uh, you know, the focus, the focus of this theoretical energy company. Um, if you just look at the top, most people are interested in greater energy efficiency. We'd love to hear that. That will respond most positively to that. Why? Again, I would argue it's probably because they can see themselves in it, right? Greater energy efficiency means that maybe uh, I'll save some money, right? If this uh, company was in my, uh, provided energy, energy to my, my home. The next two are really interesting, uh, a healthier environment and a cleaner environment because they seem almost synonymous, right? And yet healthier environment uh, does have a significant, a couple of percentage points anyway, uh, bump over a cleaner environment. And again, I would argue it's because you can see um, a human element there, right? In a healthier environment, somebody's actually healthy. 
um, there's more, uh, there's a person there who's experiencing a greater sense of well-being. Whereas in a cleaner environment, um, which might be the same environment, um, doesn't have that human element in it. So people don't respond to it. Uh, they may not, again, it's not a conscious thing. It's just uh, what we're uh, sort of subconsciously hardwired to uh, react to and so on. So uh, you'll notice also becoming carbon neutrals down near the bottom. Um, you, can, you can imagine responders, you know, some not knowing what that means exactly, right? Or maybe identifying it with, uh, you know, a political affiliation that they don't see themselves as part of. Um, so fascinating stuff and all, all stuff that you can use once you um, learn uh, the sort of terminology that will work and what, what won't work um, and uh, put it towards uh, creating better narratives for yourself. <coughs> In terms of the impact and the sharing uh, of your communications, it's also important to, to think about how the sort of mechanics of how this might work out in the, in the world. Again, um, here's a little bit more evidence that um, more frequent reference to human beings um, in the scientific material, whatever it is, the more likely it is to be shared out in the world, you know, by the internet or, or person to person. Um, what we have here are rankings coming out of this one uh, journal article um, in terms of uh, work in these specific disciplines and their likelihood and, uh, of being shared. In, a sense, in essence, their popularity, right, uh, with um, being shared amongst friends uh, or, or, or acquaintances, right? Psychology, economics, it's, it's a little bit easier to see yourselves in it, right? Especially psychology, you know, this goes back to tell me about me. If I can read a book and, and learn a little something about um, my own behavior that I don't quite understand, um, the books that I showed you earlier, uh, Kahneman uh, and, and Thaler, they are all about that, right? And they're very, very popular books. Um, economics, sociology, and down to the physical sciences, it becomes harder and harder to kind of find the human element there. Um, and, and, and as a result, they're less likely to be shared. Um, this can, I believe, can be overcome, but it is interesting to know. <clears throat> and, and likewise, out in the internet, when we're talking about these emotions, um, what is most likely to be shared with specific, uh, with re respect to specific emotions? Well, um, uh, the same researchers, uh, John uh, Berger and Catherine Milkman, um, wrote a different piece, uh, a different study, and what they came up with is that uh, the high arousal uh, emotions are the ones that um, uh, promote sharing, right? So uh, it, it could be on a positive side, a sense of awe, right? Um, Maybe you've seen uh, the story of this kid, Alex Honnold, who climbed um, El Capitan with no ropes, right? Um, that was uh, shared all over the internet, right? Um, and again, that's an example of sense of awe. Negative uh, as well, and this probably comes as no surprise, uh, a high arousal emotion on the negative side also will get shared quite a bit. Anger and anxiety. Um, if you can uh, tap into those emotions, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily the way to go, but we all know what that's like. The, the, much of the internet is this sort of cauldron of, of, of rage. Um, and this is partly why, um, because we're so you know, uh, susceptible to being um, uh, in that emotional state, uh, to, to be uh, sort of uh, have our attention drawn to it and to uh, be engaged um, and uh, pay more attention to those messages that uh, inspire these emotions they're more shared and they become more prevalent and you, you get this sort of, um, well, vicious or virtuous cycle, depending on how you wanna look at it, uh, in terms of the, what be, seems to be the primary discourse out there in the world. And science you know, uh, sort of plays a, a part in this in that um, if you can identify something in your work that, um, again, has a human element, but you know, hopefully on, on the positive side, right, can inspire awe, and, and develop a story around that, then you might have, uh, you know, be able to tap into these emotions and increase the, uh, the spreading of the, the communication that you are trying to put out there in the world. Now you can see this being done on the other side of things, okay? Um, a couple of years ago, this report came out from an organization called the National Association of Scholars. Now, NAS, you know, it's not the National Academy of Sciences, okay? it's the National Association of Scholars, which is a think tank, um, that uh, is funded, as far as I can tell, by um, uh, conservative investors. Um, and they came out with a report, and some of you are probably familiar with this, Sustainability, Higher Education's New Fundamentalism. Um, again, sp picking up on specific words, and in this case, imagery, right? We can see what they're trying to do and tap into those very things that are gonna A, make an impact, B, 
B, led, lead to more sort of a viral spreading of this particular document and story, right? Uh, maybe uh, get uh, to news sources and, and bloggers who can then spread the story even more. Um, <clears throat> all this is very consciously chosen and designed, right? Higher education, new fundamentalism, of course, that, that, that word is loaded, uh, particularly loaded since 9-11, uh, right? And we, the image they choose to put on the front cover here is one that is, uh, you know, we have a, a protester who's associated with the climate movement who uh, looks extremely angry, the clenched fist, um, you know, uh, is in an urban environment which has, comes with connotations of its own, um, all of which add up to a, a very powerful, very kind of quick message. Now, is this effective communication? Perhaps, right? They're, at the very least, we should acknowledge that they're trying to um, uh, use these uh, sort of dynamics and uh, of the way we respond to media out there, especially on the internet, but out there in the world in particular, and, and stories, um, uh, how we do, do, uh, create the own, uh, our own narratives around just an image and a couple of words, um, and uh, how that relates to the sort of success, let's just say, of their um, messaging. <clears throat> okay, so well, what does this mean for, for you? How, how, can, how can you uh, begin to take some of these uh, ideas and put them towards your own work? Raymond Carver um, said, I deliberately tried to pick stories, and in, he's introducing a book of short stories that he edited, uh, that rendered in more or less straightforward manner what it's like out there. I wanted the stories that I selected to throw some light on what it is that makes us and keeps us often against great odds recognizably human. Um, and th that's always going to be the starting point in, in trying to fashion your own stories. Um, you find the human in your research. Okay, not the human, this single individual, but what makes it, what, what is human there, right? What makes it human? Um, how, how does what you study and your work and your research affect somebody in a, in a very sort of practical way? Um, can you translate the sort of technicalities to something that involves a, a person, a, someone who does this incredibly well? is Michael Lewis, who I'm sure all of you know, and you probably you know, have read some, if not many of his books, right? He's a very popular author. Um, and he, what he does, he takes on these difficult technical topics, like um, the uh, global financial crisis and credit default swaps and you know, uh, uh, mortgage bonds, or in Flash Boys, um, uh, high frequency trading, um, stuff that is just dry as dust, if you just kind of look at it objectively, okay? But what he does is the first thing, um, his first objective is to find a person at the center of that story who fits the dramatic world that Aristotle was talking about, that I, that I, I was talking about a little bit earlier, right? Who's trying to do something? Who has discovered something that um, they need to kind of get out into the world? Or who's um, discovered a truth that they need to find out more about and are going to encounter incredible obstacles in order to try to um, get to that truth? That's the story, okay? Um, it's not, uh, and in the process of telling the story of that one person, all the other technical stuff comes to the fore and um, becomes elucidated. Um, this is hard to do, okay? Uh, or baseball. In baseball statistics can be very dry, but he finds Billy Bean, who's the, man uh, the general manager of the, or, uh, the, sorry, the A's, Oakland A's, and he um, uh, gives us his struggle against the entire league, against the doubters, et cetera, and how he triumphs at the end. Um, it's all right there in Aristotle's rules. Um, again, with very technical information, which is delivered over the course of the story. Um, and so for you, this um, is sort of part of the challenge, right? Um, <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to come up with a story where you can find something that's human that'll connect right off the bat with your audience. Um, in terms of your audience, right, you can do a little bit, of, uh, again, a little bit of research so that you're, you know, at the end of the day, you're not um, going out there with the uh, sort of urge to educate, which can be, um, if you're trying to tell a story, uh, sort of death, actually. Uh, and we all know what that's like, right? If we are expecting a story and instead we get a, a lecture of some kind, and I've been guilty of this uh, uh, plenty of times, um, uh, people turn off, right? Because that's not part of that original contract, you know, when you said once upon a time. Um, here with an example of uh, climate change, um, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, Yale has a Center for Climate Change Communications where they have all kinds of incredible, uh, essentially, um, audience data that you can tap into and, and pour through. And here's a little bit uh, of it, uh, including one of the more famous parts of it, the Six Americas, where the, uh, the researchers went out and really identified um, six different sort of demographic groups, 
um, in terms of how they think about climate change and what they expect um, or hope to get from a, a more information with respect to climate change um, in, in the future. Uh, you can see the six groups over there on the left, alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. People who are dismissive, you know, it, it's gonna be almost impossible to engage them um, on, on any level, right? They've already sort of made up their mind. On the uh, other end of the spectrum, the alarmed, uh, many of us might consider ourselves part of this, right? Um, are very concerned about climate change and are looking for um, information that's gonna help us uh, act on it. And if you see in this figure, Five over here again pulled from their research you can see that um, <clears throat> if they could pose a single question to a climate scientist this is roughly where uh, the sort of the the area of uh, concern that um, you, you'd find uh, these particular respondents depending on which demographic they're in this is incredibly useful information because if you know who your audience is right um, and that you're speaking to at any given time right or it could be a single person or it could be a room full of people right um, and you know, where, you know where, roughly where they fall in, uh, in terms of these six different Americas, you can shape your story and uh, uh, your research accordingly so that you can reach them more effectively, right? <clears throat> Dismissive, again, uh, on this far end, you know, they're looking for more and more evidence. So you might present, you know, shape your presentation uh, in terms of hard evidence uh, on you know, the other end of the spectrum. They wanna know how to, to act on this, right? And so um, you could uh, present a story that, that uh, addresses that Need, and you'll be much more likely to get a higher attentiveness and uh, more uh, audience engagement. The form that you eventually choose to take when you, uh, you know, embark on this um, is also important. Um, believe it or not, the form you choose uh, goes a long way in terms of uh, establishing your sort of authenticity. Um, it should be the right form for you, right? Uh, it, it, you, there could be, uh, there's almost an endless number of ways you can do this um, from uh, creating animations like Annie Leonard did with the story of stuff, um, to a graphic novel, um, to uh, using Twitter, um, to uh, Catherine Hayhoe, Hayhoe down here at the bottom who all, uh, creates YouTube videos, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you one in just a second, um, to blogs, and it's even Anthony Bourdain up here um, in uh, Parts Unknown. I don't know uh, how familiar you are with this particular show. Uh, you know, may he rest in peace. Um, but this show, while posing, is kind of a travelogue and a foodie show. Right, is uh, deals with sustainability topics almost every episode. It's it's, it's really quite uh, impressive, and I think um, uh, it's uh, again a different kind of storytelling that is popularized and yet gets the information across in emotional way just about every time out. Um, and uh, a sort of fascinating example to, to look at. So depending on you know what um, you want to communicate, uh, you want to choose the right form, and that just sort of depends on your own work and who you're trying to reach. <clears throat> It is interesting, uh, while we're all looking at these different forums, to, um, to, and important to talk about the power of visuals versus text. Um, this is sort of common knowledge, but here's a decent example of two different stories, right, um, with respect to global warming, and um, just the different uh, choices of imagery here uh, will have a, long, a huge effect on ter in terms of engagement with your audience right out of the gate, right? So this, over here, global warming is messing with the jet stream. That means more extreme weather. The image they chose makes sense, right? Here's the jet stream, and um, uh, we can see it moving around. Now, as a layman, I may or may not be engaged with this because I don't know what this means. How does this differ from a normal jet stream? I don't, I don't really know. Um, whereas this image down here speaks uh, much more sort of uh, directly to an emotional side, right? We, this may well be a normal wave, but the way it's shot um, looks like it's just about fully engulfing uh, this cityscape uh, along the coast over here. Um, even the horizon is tilted a little bit to, to add to that. And so without, again, subconsciously, I'm already starting to think about what the consequences might be. And I'm engaged and I'm much more likely to kind of go in there and start to read the article. Once you start to thought, think about this yourself, I, what I encourage you to do is to reach out to folks on campus in, in your immediate sphere, uh, you know, on your, in, in your um, institution, uh, people who do this all the time, right? And uh, the typical departments are journalism, or you know, what I do is film and video production. Uh, on, on the audio side, you have radio and podcasting, et cetera, uh, PR, social media. Um, again, all of these are story 
industries, right? This is all people in these fields think about all the time, right? How to best tell the story, how to engage with your audience. And so if you're not sure to, how to do this, which, you know, of course is, is, is reasonable and, and natural because you, if you're not doing this all the time, um, reach out to the people who are. And um, I, I think you'll find that they'll be very receptive to hearing what you uh, want to do and trying to help you figure out a way to do it. And then once you do it, just keep doing it, right? Because persistence and uh, your consistency it tends to be the key. Um, and you see again here, Catherine Hayhoe, who has created a whole bunch of different videos uh, on her Global Weirding uh, YouTube channel page. Um, and uh, she's developed a reputation. And, and the more you do it, the more people will continue to come back. And um, uh, this is sort of how social media works, right? Um, uh, if you can't just put one thing out there and expect it to gain traction, you need to be consistent in delivering a message. <clears throat> okay, and so the, and the final thing I'll leave you with is, is well, you know, sort of the, what underlies all of this, which is that what comes from the heart goes to the heart. Again, what's going to be right for you is not going to be right for necessarily anybody else, but if you're honest, sincere about the, the message and the information you're trying to get out there as you shape these stories, um, thinking about all the stuff, you know, the rules and, and all that, it, the most important thing is this, that if you... Um, you care about what you're talking about, people will hear what you're saying and they'll care too. And with that, I'll, I'll leave you and, and um, uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Will, it's Ira. Thank you so much for that great presentation. A lot of food for thought. And in fact, as I was um, trying to structure our remaining time uh, and address some of the questions, uh, I uh, was thinking that at some point soon we may need to do a follow-up webinar and discussion, uh, particularly on differentiating uh, educational dialogue, political discourse, and mainstream media, uh, if not other distinctions. But sure. for today's purposes, uh, throughout the webinar, uh, attendees were posting questions and comments and I came across uh, four of them that I think are pretty basic and I'd at least like to tie off uh, the basics uh, for those who are still on and will be listening to uh, the recording. So I'm going to read you um, this uh, sequence of questions and comments and let you structure your response to tie things up in a neat bow for us today. So um, okay. earlier, um, uh, Matt Polsky uh, posted, if science is about the truth, stories, at least fictional ones, are not by definition. So there would seem to be a compatibility problem unless you want to argue that fiction provides a deeper truth. Not unrelated to that, Greg Moore posted, in our class on environmental impact analysis, we teach how to prepare documents under the California Environmental Quality Act and NEPA. We caution not to couch setting impacts, mitigation, and alternatives in emotion triggering prose, but rather to tell the facts fully, objectively, and dispassionately. How can storytelling help prepare better environmental impact documents while maintaining that objective fact presenting role? Then Max Gelber said, so many stories, so many platforms and mechanisms by which to share stories. How do you break through the noise, especially considering the popularity of celebrity stories over what he considers to be the more important sustainability climate change stories and news? And then echoing some other comments, Francis Littman said, can you please give us a brief example how you would use the plot and storyline of a sustainability story with facts to share? So um, please feel free, Will, to uh, tackle that grouping of questions as you uh, wrap up for today. Sure. Okay. Um, let me take these one at a time and do, do sort, uh, sort of the best I, uh, that I can. These are terrific questions. Um, so the first from Matt uh, about uh, the, the, the potential conflict 
uh, between um, storytelling techniques and uh, sort of the pursuit of truth in, in science. Um, I, I, I totally get the, the um, what you're saying. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. Well, actually, maybe not that complicated. As far as I can see it, uh, storytelling, if it's done uh, with integrity, right, um, you're after a greater, like I said, a, a greater truth, right? Um, and um, the techniques, we, you want to keep them kind of separate, right? The techniques that we associate with fiction um, are just techniques, okay? And you can use those same techniques to tell a, a very compelling nonfiction story, for example, right? Um, which is not uh, by definition false or, fic or made up, right? Or, or not fact-based. Um, and uh, that's really sort of what uh, I'm, I'm getting at here uh, in terms of what may be of use to uh, the scientific community. Um, I also want to think uh, a little bit in terms of uh, separating um, certain moments in terms of and uh, conveying the science and your own work, right? Because uh, as, as important as it is, of course, to be objective and fact-based when it comes to uh, um, relating your research, let's just say, right? Um, you still have to, if you're engaging with other people in, it, let's say, an auditorium or a conference hall, um, you're a human being interacting with other human beings. And so what Aristotle was talking about with the ethos and the pathos part of it, um, you can't get away from. Okay, there's no, there's no way to, um, uh, to be a purely objective, fact-based um, presenter, let's just say. Um, and to that end, these techniques can be useful in terms of a establishing again a, some level of credibility and trust just by presenting yourself as a you know a, a decent human being let's just say um, to your audience uh, and then going into perhaps the, mo the more evidence based uh, hardcore science stuff right um, that will have a, a big impact on the overall sort of um, uh, I, I would I would put forward the success of any given presentation. Um, in terms of the platforms, uh, another good question, how do you break through the noise? Well, that, that, that's the one that everybody uh, wants to know the answer to, and we don't necessarily have a particular answer. Again, all I can say on, on this front is that if you're going to um, uh, think about doing this, you want to tell as honest and true a story as, as possible, uh, regard, you know, regardless of what you're using as initial content to, um, to put forward into the world, because um, uh, you know, audiences have have a way of finding that stuff and, and gravitating towards it. Now, I know that's not much reassurance to somebody who uh, may want a little bit more of a def definitive answer. Um, um, but sort of what I was saying with one of my last slides in terms of being persistent, like Catherine Hayhoe has been, um, you know, it's almost a kind of a leap of faith. But if you if you put yourself out there and continue to um, speak uh, uh, truthfully, right, and only you can be the ultimate judge of whether, whether what you're putting out there is to uh, is honest to God in your gut truth uh, as, as best as you can uh, muster it. Um, you'll find an audience. Okay, uh, that, that's sort of um, the best that I, I, I can say there. Now, depending, on, you can increase your chances by identifying who you want to reach and uh, then looking at the different ways to get to those people. Um, different formats, different technologies, and different platforms will reach different audiences, of course. Okay. Um, but um, but it really starts with uh, the sort of integrity of your intentions. Um, and uh, for what was the last question here, Ira? The uh, the one for uh, looking for a specific example of how you would uh, lay out uh, the p plot for sustainability or climate change. Sure. Um, hmm. <coughs> well, let's just look at something that we're all all, all familiar with, right? Which is. Um, an inconvenient truth and an inconvenient sequel. I presume that you know most of us have seen both of those um, movies. If you recall from the first one, um, here is uh, Al Gore um, presenting um, himself, presenting essentially uh, information on climate change, and really it was uh, you know for those in terms of the popular consciousness, it was a big step forward in terms of uh, raising awareness uh, uh, as to global warming and climate change and how it's happening. Um, if you recall from that first movie, um, the story is a little bit of, uh, you know, he's presenting all this information, um, which is, of course, the gist of it. But the movie itself is not about that. The movie is about him and his journey 
um, in terms of trying to get this presentation together, trying uh, essentially to recover from the election of 2000, right, uh, and um, continue to get the the, the word out uh, uh, regarding climate change, which is has become the focus of his life. Um, the overall message that came out of that movie um, and some of the, the criticism he received was um, negative be because, uh, well, for a number of reasons. Number one, um, on the ethical, if we want to consider the, uh, from the persuasion perspective, from the, his ethical stance, being who he is, was a little bit problematic potentially because Al at that time was kind of a divisive figure, very divisive um, politically. Right. So if you had somebody who was trying to tell you something very important and that person you already had preconceived notions about and maybe liked a lot or maybe disliked quite a bit, um, you know, that had an effect on the overall communication. But part of it also was that it was a little bit doom and gloom, which I know that Deborah Rowe did an earlier webinar on that kind of climate change messaging. What we see in the second movie is that he's changed that all around. Now, things have have changed in the culture. Right. And, and technology was as well. And so he had different information to present. But if you recall from that uh, second attempt at telling the same story, his um, uh, sort of whole angle was very different. It was um, positive, it was optimistic, it was sort of uh, personal and passionate, um, which uh, led to, uh, you know, I think a different, very different kind of, uh, of message. And I know that when we screened it here at school, um, people had a very different response than they did. Um, uh, we we're talking about this a little bit, uh, different response um, than what they remember uh, feeling after seeing the first movie, which was a little bit more uh, sort of disconsolate. Um, now, I don't, I'm not sure if that entirely answers your question, but I think it's a decent example of where storytelling elements are built into both of those movies and they only succeed to the, to the extent that people continue to watch them because the story is about him. He's the character, okay? Um, the dramatic hero of, of the story uh, and all the scientific information is, is um, passed on along the way. Um, if that makes, I hope that makes sense. Um, but at least that's how I read those particular movies. Well, uh, thank you for wrapping it up so nicely, Will. Again, great presentation. And uh, I would like to um, explore how we can continue the conversation uh, with this audience, uh, most of which is uh, still with us here into overtime. I'll just mention uh, in concluding, uh, in my experiences with Al Gore and Frank Luntz here inside the Beltway, uh, Al Gore uh, certainly starts off all of his talks with uh, a lighthearted comment uh, because he was burned very badly in uh, the presidential debates when he rolled his eyes at Bush and uh, came off as the smartest guy in the room, which apparently most of the country uh, doesn't like that type of arrogant approach. Similarly, Frank Luntz uh, in political discourse is the fellow who has brought us the notion that Republicans should not call the Democratic Party the Democratic Party, but should call it the Democrat Party. So when you see people on CNN talking about the Democrat Party, uh, you can thank Frank Luntz for that insight uh, into terminology in political discourse. But that's why I think we need to further discuss the distinctions between political discourse uh, mainstream media and uh, educational uh, discussions. And uh, again, sure. thank you, Will. And uh, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thanks to everyone who has stuck with us here. And uh, please join us uh, for upcoming webinars. And if you yourself would like to present, please contact me directly. With that, signing off for today. Thank you. Thank you.